There are a few data points we're watching carefully this week. Um, and among them is Oracle, which reported after the close today. The stock is up strongly, uh, up 27%. And in our view, it's really affirming that IT spending and the visibility uh, for AI spending remains strong. And I think we're already seeing companies benefiting, benefiting from this. For instance, Google has eliminated 30, 35% of managers seeing small teams. Keep in mind, as we think about AI, that the majority of these companies are based in the US. And that gets us to valuation. Um, you know, I, I think the company to look at in terms of AI and the unique, uniqueness of it is NVIDIA, which uh, currently trades at 26.6 times forward earnings. I don't think that's particularly expensive considering that Costco and Walmart actually trade at much higher multiples, 48 and a half and 39 times. And so to me, the question remains that if NVIDIA is the scarcest company in AI, why is its multiple so low relative to Staples? NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wang recently talked about the U.S. tech stack and how it compares to China's, even threw in the U.S. dollar in the same breath, which caught the eye of President Trump. If you're scratching your head wondering, what is this tech stack, uh, sit back, because, because today on Stocks in Translation, we're going to break that down for you. Now, first, let's take a listen to what Jensen himself had to say to Yahoo Finance after NVIDIA's recent earnings. The American tech stack should be the world standard, just as the American dollar is the world standard that economies are built on. We want the American tech stack for the world's technology and industries to be built on. And that includes China. Now let's define this term. In tech, a stack is already a metaphor, a layered view of how the parts of technology work together. For AI, you can think of it as a hierarchy or a stack with hardware at the bottom all the way up to the apps you use at the top. And here's how it breaks down by layer. We have applications at the very top. That's chat bots, design apps, and company tools people actually use and touch. Below that are platforms, the basic software tools used to build and run those apps. Then comes the infrastructure, which is a cloud and data centers, big facilities running services and AI. And on top of all of that, it's built on the hardware layer. That's chips, servers, and the equipment that connects them. So how does the tech stack compare to China? In this chart, we have each bar is a country with the US at the left and the China at the right here. Each color is a different, uh, a different layer of the stack and it's in the same order as before. We had to make a lot of assumptions to get these numbers, so take them with a grain of salt. And what we're attempting to measure or estimate is the annual flow of revenue or sales for the hardware and software items. And for infrastructure, by the way, we're using capital spending instead of sales. The devil's in the details, as they say, but when you add it all up, it's easy to see that the hardware layer alone in the US, at that set the, that's in the bottom in white, that is larger than the value of China's entire stack. And it all totals to about $725 billion annually in the US, compared to about $125 billion worth for China. So why bring up the business of the US dollar dominance? Because the dollar is the world's reserve currency, which is a widely held national currency used to trade, borrow, and save across borders. Reserve status means it's trusted, easy to move, and accepted everywhere. And now we can compare how widely the US dollar is held versus the Chinese yuan, its currency. If you add it all up, the world's currencies held by all the central banks, it comes out to the equivalent of over $12 trillion. And the US dollar share of that is just under 7 trillion, which means that the dollar makes up about 60% of the pie worldwide. And that compares to about a quarter trillion dollars for China, or just under 2%. And getting back to Huang's original point, we can now compare U.S. tech stack dominance to that of the U.S. dollar. Here we have these two worlds side by side. The U.S. tech stack is about six times as big as China's, so that ratio is six to one. Meanwhile, the dollar's holdings are about 25 times that of the Chinese yuan, so that's a 25 to one ratio. In other words, the dollar is much more dominant than the U.S. tech stack. And just to be clear, this is a very apples to oranges comparison. But the whole purpose of this exercise is to view the global AI race from the perspective of the leaders that are shaping it, not only on the tech side of AI, but also on the government policy side. It's also an interesting way to think about relative scale. And the bottom line is, think of the tech stack as today's competition for global standards, like the dollar and finance. The U.S. leads it for now, but the race is definitely on.
historical shares have outperformed the S&P 500 this year, gaining more than 90 percent. And joining us right now with more on what's driving growth at Oracle and some of the other big tech names is Doug Clinton. He is Intelligent Alpha founder and CEO. Yeah, top uh, that, Doug. Doug, I think it's pretty easy, right? <laughs> it's AI and the promise of more money being poured into that pursuit of AI. That's right. I can't compete with the animal orchestra, but no. <laughs> Oracle, I can say this. They are a stock to watch. They've had a great year so far, up 90% now year to date. And I think there's a bigger thing that's going on as we think about what happened with their earnings, why the stock was up so much this week. And the reason is because I think we got a question answered, which is we keep wondering, you know, when are the hyperscalers going to slow down this CapEx spend? And the answer from Oracle, I think pretty definitively, is no time soon. And if you look at companies like Google and Amazon, the expectations for them for CapEx next year are high single digits, 10%. I think that's too low. I think all of these hyperscalers driven by Oracle's strong entry into this cloud game, they're going to have to continue to invest in building more infrastructure because the demand for AI services is there. Hey, hey, Doug, I, anybody who's been a naysayer on any of these major companies that are on the receiving end of the money coming through for, for building out the AI infrastructure has gotten burned and burned pretty badly. Um, but there is a new story out from the Wall Street Journal today that raises questions about how much is riding on the funding challenges coming from OpenAI. They point out that in the last nine months, OpenAI has committed to spending about $60 billion a year for computing from Oracle. $18 billion on that data center venture that it's doing, um, $10 billion of customized chips, and that's just a start of what they've promised. But they are losing billions of dollars right now. They're on track to make about $13 billion in revenue this year, and th the math doesn't add up there. They have to get to a point where they can access in more investing dollars or the capital markets in some way, shape, or form. And I, I know they're on their way to doing that. They have this memorandum of understanding with Microsoft. But there are some other things that are hanging out there, including California regulators that might say, no, you can't do this. Um, because as Elon Musk has pointed out, that's not the way you can transition from a not-for-profit to a profitable company. What, uh, do you have any concerns about the open AI piece of this alone? I don't. And, and what's, I think, really interesting about this, Becky, is if you think about what open AI is doing, they're actually they're playing the venture capital game at a scale that people have never seen before. That's something that's new, I think, in this cycle with AI, where to your point, I mean, they are committing to tens of billions of dollars that they haven't raised yet, that don't yet have assured access to. And they're sort of saying, you know, if we build it, they will come. They're seeing the demand on the customer side. I think they're seeing the demand in terms of revenue accelerating only at 13 billion run rate. They'll probably be at 20 billion by the end of the year and look to double that next year. And so I think what Sam Altman is doing, and he comes from the venture capital world, is he's saying, you know, this is how the game is played at the highest level. And I think that they will be able to sort these things out because I do think that this, the demand from the customer side is there. That's what we keep hearing from all of these companies is that they can't keep up with the demand. So let, let's talk about where you really come down as a stock picker on this. Do you like Oracle after being up 83% year to date and up 30 or 31 percent just this week alone, would you still buy in? We unfortunately don't own Oracle and at Intelligent Alpha, we do use AI to do our stock analysis, our stock picking in the, the well, mega AI cap space. That. It's that's right. AI missed Oracle, unfortunately, in this case. But what I think our, our models do like, they're continuing to say, look, if you think about call it the tremendous 10 or whatever we want you know, as we add Oracle, TSM, you know, Broadcom to the mag seven. We do like NVIDIA first, Microsoft, and then TSM. Those are our three picks that our models favor the most. And I think if you think about that reality,